This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. Hello, Galveston. (laughs) This is Texas. Has to be big, right? (laughs) From Microbe TV, this is TWIV. This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on October 3rd, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are back on the road. We are recording in Galveston, Texas. We are at the University of Texas Medical Branch. And joining me here, my co-host, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. Good to be here on the road again, where it is in Galveston. We have to do this. It is 88 degrees and sunny. It's a beautiful day. Haven't been outside much, but... Beautiful day. This is my first trip to Galveston. Yours too. Right? Mine too. Mine too. And we had a nice drive down here. It's great. We have had a wonderful tour, thanks to Dennis and, and others of the facilities here, the Galveston National Laboratory and others. And I, I'm, I just love it. It's great. I've learned so much. And now we have an opportunity to speak with three professors here. The theme is going to be virus hunters, people who have spent their lives Uh, hunting down new viruses. So let's introduce them. Uh, By the way, you see the front here, there are these t-shirts. These are TWIV World Tour 2018 t-shirts. On the back is a list of all the places we've been. And next year, next year's version will have Galveston on it. I'm gonna toss these out at the end. So stay, don't leave if you want a t-shirt. And uh, you probably need to be closer because I can't reach you then. Neither can you, right, Rich? All right, our guests are all professors here at the university, and they also have some other roles. Uh, All the way down there at the end, he's the director of the Galveston National Laboratory, Jim LeDuc. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you very much, sir. Happy to be here. Pleasure. Uh, Next to him, Bob Tesh. Welcome. Thank you. And the closest to us, he's also uh, director of high containment laboratory operations, Tom Kaizek, welcome. Thank you. Tom gave us a great tour this morning, and hopefully he can tell you some of the things he he told us. Really amazing. So let's start by talking about your your backgrounds. I mean, we're interested in where you're from originally and uh, the training that led up to you being here. And I actually want to want to interject one thing here for the listeners out there in podcast land. So one of the things that makes this site uh, special is the existence of a high containment laboratory, BSL-4, the highest biosafety level. And that's been a a feature of uh, our visit here. And we had a tour this morning. It was terrific. And that'll be a a feature of the show. Okay, Jim, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, thank you. And first, thank you guys for coming. It's really a pleasure and an honor to have you here on campus. Um, I, I grew up in Southern California from uh, uh, pretty humble beginnings and uh, went to Long Beach State uh, where I got a degree in, in zoology and uh, focused on field biology. Uh, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do, but this was the middle of the Vietnam War. It turned out that uh, one of my professors had a good friend at the Smithsonian Institution who had an army-sponsored grant which was underway in West Africa. So I was able to get uh, hired on to that, and for the next two years I lived in a tent in West Africa uh, collecting rats and mice and bats and uh, all sorts of critters, as they call them here in Texas. And uh, uh, from that, I, uh, uh, the, the program officer from the army came and visited said, uh, so what are you doing about the draft? And I said, well, I'm, I'm hiding in Africa. And he said, uh, if that doesn't work, here's my card. Well, uh, so he talked a little bit, and he told me about direct commissions into the military. So I, uh, when I got my draft notice at the end of my first year, I thought I'd better call him up. Uh, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but going in as an officer versus going in the middle of uh, the Vietnam War as an infantryman, I thought maybe an officer was better. So. I, I ended up going into the military and found some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. Uh, just an incredible environment of uh, academic excellence, uh, scientific excellence, and, and real passion for, 
for the work they were doing. And, and I ended up spending uh, 23 years in, in the Army with assignments uh, many places around the world. I then uh, retired from the Army and went to work for the Centers for Disease Control, uh, where I was actually deployed my first assignment to the World Health Organization, where I spent uh, four years uh, working as the, uh, the technical expert for arboviruses and hemorrhagic fevers. And then I uh, went to Atlanta and stayed there until 2006, where, uh, and at CDC, I was in charge of the division of viral and rickettsial diseases that had all, virtually all uh, virus diseases under our responsibility, except HIV and some of the vector-borne diseases. And then 2006, I, I was recruited here to help stand up the laboratory, and I've been here ever since. So, more than you wanted to know. But no, no, it's great. It's great. I want to know a little bit more. So, are, are you a PhD? Or I, I'm a PhD. I, I benefited from uh, the Army program that allows uh, officers to go for graduate training, and so they gave me all of about uh, two years to get a PhD. But I, I was able to get it. I went to UCLA and. Uh, I, I did a lot of my research, actually, at the, the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. So I, I basically had my dissertation research done concurrent with my, uh, my graduate training. Did you work on viruses then? Sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I worked on Keystone virus, which is a, uh, a member of the California serogroup viruses. And, and my research topic at that time, people didn't know how viruses uh, overwintered, how they, they survived in, in nature during adverse conditions. And we were able to, uh, uh, to demonstrate transovarial transmission uh, of the, this keystone virus, which at that time was, was pretty big news. So did you do field work with the Army? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was assigned uh, to Panama, and uh, I was assigned at the mouth of the Amazon in Belang, Brazil. Uh, and then the last half of my career, I was at Fort Detrick, where their biocontainment lab is, and and we did a tremendous amount of work at that time. This was just when the Hanta viruses were being discovered, and we did a lot of work in Korea and uh, in China, uh, as as the story, as the isolation of Hanta and Hantan virus, and then sequentially some of the other old world Hanta viruses. So early on, you wanted to do field work, and you got it in spades. Sounds like. Yeah. A lot of field work. A lot right. of field work, yes, sir. How, how far back do you know these two gentlemen from? Well, we didn't go to high school together, but, <laughs> 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 but uh, I, I, I've known them each for 30, 40 years. So. Okay. So, Bob, tell us uh, your story. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, and I went to college at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania with the idea that I wanted to be a doctor or, or a veterinarian. And along the way, I decided I preferred to go to medical school. So I applied and was accepted at Jefferson Medical College in, in Philadelphia. When I finished there, I uh, did a rotating internship in San Francisco General Hospital and then started a pediatric residency. Um, and like these guys, uh, at that time, they were drafting interns and residents to go to Vietnam. So I enlisted in the public health service as, as my selective service obligation. And I was sent by uh, the PHS as a Peace Corps doctor in Brazil. And so I lived for two years in northeast Brazil, where my main job was taking care of Peace Corps volunteers. But I had an opportunity to travel all around Brazil. And then I went back uh, after that to Tulane University uh, to take a fellowship in pediatric infectious diseases, thinking I was still going to be a pediatrician. And there I got interested in research, and they encouraged you to take a, some coursework. So I got an MS in epidemiology. And at that point, then I was looking for a job, and Carl Johnson offered me a job at the Middle America Research Unit in Panama, which uh, the Middle America Research Unit was run jointly by the U.S. Army and uh, the National Institutes of Health in the canal zone, in the old canal zone. So I spent five years there, and then that lab was closed, as, I think partly because of the, the budget crunch from the money that was being spent in Vietnam. And they sent me then, NIH sent me to the Pacific Research Section. They had another laboratory in Honolulu to work under Leon Rosen. 
And that was interesting, although there wasn't much to study in Hawaii. Dengue had not come back to Hawaii. It was there in the Second World War, but it hadn't yet returned. So we worked mostly in the South Pacific, and I had some opportunity to go to, to work in Asia, in Taiwan, where Tom was, uh, Malaysia, and also had an opportunity to work in Iran. I spent four months one summer working in Iran, which was very interesting. Um, and then, after seven years in Honolulu, the NIH closed that lab as well. <laughs> and I decided I would move to academia, and Bob Shope offered me a job at Yale, the Yale Harbor Virus Research Unit. So I went to Yale, uh, and I was in the Arbor Virus Unit, which is in the School of Medicine at Yale, for 15 years. And then uh, when David Walker started the Center for Tropical Diseases here, I decided maybe I would apply for that. So both Bob Shope and I moved at the same time uh, to Galveston. And we brought with us the, the Yale Arbor Virus Research Unit collection of viruses, which we called then the World Reference Center of Arbor Viruses. Uh, and so we brought this large collection of viruses to Galveston, and I've been here for the last 25 years. So what years were you at Yale? I went in 1980 and I left in 95. And was there, uh, was Yale happy to give up the collection? Hmm. <laughs> no. Well, it's interesting, and I didn't know this at the time, but I was made the director of the, of the reference center. Bob made me the director, Bob Shope. And so the grant that we had, the reference center was supported by a number of different grants. The Army supported it for a while, the Navy did, even the Australian government, we had grants from WHO. But the major support for the reference center came from NIH, NIAID. And when I called the program officer and said, I'm going to leave, and I didn't want to take the collection because Bob, first I didn't think Bob was going to go. And he said, but it belongs to you. You're the PI, so you can take it with you. <laughs> so, so then I talked to Bob, and we both decided we'd come. So we took it. And actually, the agreement was we would leave half of everything at Yale, and we did. You know, if we, there were 10 vials of dengue one, we took five and, and left five here. But over the years, they didn't keep that. In fact, they gave it most of it to CDC. Uh, but we have our collection here. So how many samples are we talking about? This, Pardon? You, this is a huge collection, right? Yeah, there are more. I think we have more now than 7,000 individual virus strains. And some of them go back, well, to the early days of the Rocker Foundation, some the 1930s, 1920s. Uh, strains of yellow fever, eastern equine encephalitis. So the, in what form are these like? Uh, do we have... Uh, Samples from patients and uh, some from patients, from arthropods, from okay. animals, okay. vertebrates, birds. Okay. Hmm. I remember when when this unit moved. I was very early in my career, and this was big news. Leaving Yale, do you remember? Mm -hmm. No, I do. I very much remember <laughs> that. And uh, yeah, it was an article in Science, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember that very well, and I, I always wondered what was behind it. Now. Now I've heard. Uh, Tom, what's your story? Well, uh, I grew up in Kansas. Uh, uh, was interested in uh, becoming a veterinarian. I uh, uh, went to veterinary school at Kansas State University. And uh, the Vietnam War, just like uh, the two other gentlemen mentioned, played a very large role in, I guess, forming my career. Uh, I, during uh, the early stages of my veterinary school, figured out that uh, like everybody else, if you didn't do something, uh, events would follow a course that you had no control over. So I volunteered uh, under something called the Early Commissioning Program to uh, go in the Air Force, and uh, I did. And uh, at the end of my uh, schooling, I went in the Air Force, and uh, eventually they had uh, programs that offered uh, training, in, uh, technical training through the Air Force Institute of Technology. And I, I got a master's degree in virology, uh, went uh, off to a couple of field assignments, and my first Air Force assignments, one in Taiwan, where I met Bob when he came to do transovarial transmission of uh, Japanese encephalitis, as I recall. And uh, 
Then uh, I went to Indonesia where we had a detachment. And uh, then I was offered another opportunity to go back. And I got a PhD in uh, virology and epidemiology from the University of California. Uh, I owed him time for this, so uh, I uh, you know, expected to probably make a career out of the services uh, doing what I like was the field aspect. So when I was in Taiwan and Indonesia, we did a lot of investigations and uh, for the governments or on other projects in influenza or Japanese encephalitis, that sort of thing. And uh, then uh, I uh, again went to uh, Berkeley and then uh, while I was at Berkeley, the Air Force uh, decided they would do away with their veterinary corps. And so I transferred to the Army, and that's how I became uh, engaged at Fort Detrick, where uh, Jim and I worked together. And uh, so I spent uh, the last eight and a half, uh, nine years of my career in the Army. I did a, a, a tour in Cairo, Egypt uh, during that time as well. And uh, then uh, I retired from the Army, and Dr. Peters, who's not here today, unfortunately, had uh, decided uh, he would take a job at CDC in the Special Pathogens Branch. And uh, he asked me uh, if I would go with him, and I did. And then I went to CDC in Atlanta in 91 and uh, spent the next 18 years there until uh, I reached sort of the age when you have to make a decision about retirement and your uh, program. And then the opportunity to move here came along. So I came here in... Uh, uh, 2008, right after I hit. So uh, that, that's sort of my career. I must say that uh, a lot of opportunities that presented themselves are uh, not necessarily things that I chose as a direction, but rather like Forrest Gump. They were things that were there, and you know, so uh, taking advantage of those situations is largely, uh, you know, been a, a good deal for my career. But uh, not often that I plotted this out. I I'm. Struck by two aspects of all of your histories. First, the military CDC is a common theme, I guess, because they provide opportunities, right? Right. And as you say, you take what's there. The other is how much you've moved around. I'm not sure people do this much anymore. Would that be a fair statement? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess things have changed somewhat in terms of where funding comes from and the opportunities that are out there. I mean, one thing I would say is field work is no longer quite as uh, available as a... Uh, uh, more difficult. Yeah. Why, why would that be? Why is field work less available? I think NIH funding has shifted for one thing. I mean, that's uh, the military uh, used to have quite a number of field labs and those have reduced quite a bit. So the opportunity for young guys to go out and get a taste of that is not as large. It's still there to some extent, but uh, it's not the same. Yeah. So uh, hopefully we'll hear some virus discovery stories from you. But before we go there, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the high containment lab here. Uh, we heard uh, Tom talk a lot about this morning. Um, what was the origin, the historical origin of high containment labs? Can you give us a sense for that? Well, I, I just uh, two weeks ago went to an occasion at CDC that celebrated 50 years of high containment there. So uh, one of the, the, the things I think that uh, precipitated there was in 67, the discovery of Marburg, uh, in uh, Europe uh, from imported monkeys that had come from Africa. And that sort of uh, made people think of these things, uh, not necessarily existing in their own countries, but for the potential for importation. And I think, you know, Bob mentioned the Peace Corps. So we had people deployed there. The military on a regular basis has people deployed and they come back. So I think it was partially a strategy for dealing with the, the potential for those same sort of things happening that I think uh, drove it. And the, the hazard, uh, be it relatively manageable, I think was recognized about then. So. Okay, so 60s is really Yeah, late 60s, late, early 70s. But did Lassa have any role in that as well as Marburg? Well, that's a, you know, may know more about that at Yale, so. Um, when the Lassa outbreak first occurred in in Nigeria, uh, some of the people who got Lhasa 
were missionary doctors and nurses, and some of them came back to the U.S. Uh, it was a nurse came back and had lost in New York City, and Jordi Casals, who was then at Yale, worked with her samples and infected himself. <laughs> he and a technician, the technician died, unfortunately. Jordi recovered. Um, but before they realized what it was and how dangerous it was. So, again, that came back with... Yeah, so we, come, we... Missionary people coming back. So she was treated at Columbia Presbyterian, which is where I am, and John Trainer, I think his name was, was involved in that, but the, apparently they gave Jordi her convalescent serum, right? Yes, Jordi got the nurse's <laughs> convalescent serum. She survived. Yeah. And he, he got her serum. Unfortunately, the technician was traveling at the time, and they didn't realize, nobody realized what he had, and then he, right. he died. So that's really the first time we recognize that viruses can be dangerous and lethal, and we need to work on them under containment. That's, what, that's about what you would say, right? Yeah, and some of the early facilities were far from what we now work in. I mean, but there was an effort at that time to you know, have special facilities that would isolate it from the general work and have a few people with uh, perhaps a little bit more yeah. training and working with them. I think you told us today that the early ones had basically glove boxes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, th that was the way up until the uh, mid to late 80s that work on uh, higher level pathogens was done. I mean, the offensive program mm -hmm. at Fort Detrick, uh, that, that was done away in 1969 was largely based in facilities that were large arrays of hood lines. Uh, and you told us today also the story of post 9-11 stimulating the <coughs> development of more. Tell us about that. Well, after 9-11, uh, you know, a couple things happened. We had uh, Marathrax in uh, pretty short order, and there was a lot of concern about bioterrorism. So that, that was sort of the impetus for the construction of the next generation of labs that uh, we're the beneficiary of, of here and uh, two academic facilities. You mentioned the needle earlier. That's the other academic center and two intramural NIH labs, uh, one in Hamilton, Montana, and the other at Fort Detrick uh, run by the NIH uh, called the IRF. So at the time of 9-11, how many high containment labs were there in the U.S.? Well, uh, you could say two or perhaps three uh, that traditionally uh, because of the expense of running these places, which nobody really had a handle on. Uh, the military ran uh, one at Fort Detrick, and the U.S. Public Health Service had uh, the, the lab in uh, Atlanta that, uh, you know, sort of uh, grown up. And both those starting out with more primitive technologies and evolving into something more like what we use now. And how many high containment labs in the U.S. are there now? I think there are eight. Uh, that would be my answer. Hmm. So the, the, uh, the development of this and the needle, you said, came out of a competition, right? Yeah, so uh, when they decided that they needed a couple of these at academic facilities, there was a competition involved. I mean, you, may, you guys may be able to say more about that. Uh, and it sort of had a down selection into a couple of sites. I think they did plan to build two, and I don't know how many people were engage in uh, offering uh, probably a one-pager at first, but... Uh, <laughs> a one-page proposal, yeah. Well, it, no, that wasn't was the final, that. but that's yeah, yeah, what they sure. started out at. It's think. remarkable. It ended up a lot more than one page. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Jim, you must remember... But there was a competition, and uh, actually there were, they, oh, they had a small BSL-4 right. lab here. Mm -hmm. That's right, the Shope um, Lab. Yeah, yeah, the Shope Lab, yes, and that was used partly to justify why we could have one, another one. That experience, yeah. So I'm curious as why you decided you wanted another one. Jim, do you, do you remember why? Well, I, I think, like a lot of things, this was a, a, an opportunity that Dr. Fauci saw. Uh, the nation was concerned about terrorism in general and uh, bioterrorism specifically, and he, he saw the opportunity to invest in the academic sector to bring that resource into the, the, the fold of addressing bioterrorism and emerging infectious diseases. So it, 
and, and you know, Congress was receptive at that time. And as a result, uh, the money was allocated. It wasn't just NIH funding, though. The states contributed this. The state of Texas, state of Texas contributed. Uh, contributed about a third of the cost. We cost about 175 million, and the state put in over 50 million. So. It's a true partnership between the the states and, and the government, but it was a stroke of genius on, on Tony's part. I, I uh, have always thought it was a stroke of genius that it very soon, and I attribute this to Fauci, became not just biodefense, Absolutely. but biodefense and emerging pathogens. Absolutely. So he saw way beyond Absolutely. the biodefense objective. Right. right. Uh, another interesting part of this is there's a medical school here, right? Absolutely. And why did that end up here uh, as opposed to somewhere else? I heard the story yesterday, but I've already forgotten it. Do any of you remember that? Why is there a medical school here? So in, in um, oh, oh, because when the University of Texas was founded, right. which was in the 1800s, uh, Galveston was a lot, they put the university in the state capital, which is in Austin. But at that time, Galveston was the largest city in Texas. Okay. And it was also a major port of entry for immigrants coming right. to the Midwest. And right, that's it. That's so it, yeah. It, it, they that put time, the medical school here. Yeah. There was a quarantine hospital yeah. here as well, yeah. I think. Here Austin was, was always jealous, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so they finally got one of their own, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah, right. One other aspect of this uh, facility which is really interesting to reveal. So of course, this is an area that gets hurricanes. So what had to be done to ensure the safety of the building, which you, which you probably didn't have to do in Hamilton, Montana, right? I don't know who would be best to address that. Let, let me take a crack at it. I, I think that the building was designed to withstand hurricanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the engineering uh, that went into the uh, the infrastructure was very rigorous, and above the recommendations, the the state the, and NIH decided to augment those even further. So the the pilings that support that building go down. They they could support a twenty story building, and mm -hmm. and you know the entire building is was designed from day one to withstand hurricanes. And when Hurricane Ike struck, we had no damage at all. So I, I mean it. The silver lining to an otherwise tragic situation was that the, the lab demonstrated that it could withstand uh, the forces of Mother Nature, and that was that was a good good thing to have behind us, and I'd like to keep it behind us. <laughs> so uh, shortly after the lab opened, a hurricane hit it. Is that correct? Uh, it wasn't the, even open yet. Yeah. Uh, wasn't open, right? But we, the, the generators were working and. And frankly, that helped to save our virus collection. Yeah. We, had, we they originally our freezers were in the basement, and we moved them all up to the second floor, hoping they wouldn't get flooded. But we didn't have electricity, and we plugged into the electricity supply of the GNL. So, and we it, had electricity. In government parlance, you reach a point called substantial completion, where the contractor hands you the keys. There's a punch list of things to to be done. That occurred at the end of August of 2008. Less than two weeks later, Hurricane Ike struck, and we really didn't know how, <laughs> how to drive the building, uh, but in fact, it, it served us well. And uh, the generators, I think, were, uh, were a major resource. And part of the, the construction was to, as you saw, to put those generators up at the second floor so that they, they were well above any surge that occurred. Mm. And I think that showed that you could take a hurricane as well. It was probably Absolutely. good Absolutely. good timing that you weren't yet working with select agents, right? This was sort of the last test before you really went hot, right? Yeah. Make, <laughs> make sure you could do this. Commissioning in the real world. <laughs> so I'm curious as to whether there's uh, uh, anything about this particular BSL-4 that distinguishes it from others in terms of facilities or uh, uh, even pathogens, the type of work that's done. Uh, let me start, and I'm sure that my colleagues will, will chime in. Um, number one, it's the, it's the people. I mean, we have uh, some of the world's experts in this field. You know, it's a small field. Not everybody works on Ebola, but we've really got uh, the world's expertise here. Um, we've got 
within the infrastructure some very unique capabilities. For example, we can generate uh, in, and measure infectious aerosols so that we can document both at BSL-3 and BSL-4 uh, infectivity of, of whatever it is that we're interested in. We've got a very robust uh, laboratory animal program so that we're, we're not just working in cell culture, we're working in, in uh, living organisms. And uh, we've, we've got a very unique aspect of uh, an insectary tickery so that we can actually grow, rear the, the vectors that are responsible for transmission for some of these diseases and do the, uh, the, the epidemiological investigations of how the vectors uh, influence transmission. So some very, very unique skill sets. Yeah, we visited the tickery this morning and it was uh, quite something. It was really yeah. good. It's cool, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is cool. And there's a turtle in there, too. Dennis will tell you all about it, I'm sure. <laughs> it's a very cool turtle. So I, I have visited here Needle, RML, and uh, Geelong. Uh -huh. So now um, it's my thing now to visit and not work in them, but just visit them. So the, the, I found this very impressive, it's, and I had no idea. So thank you, Dennis, for, for bringing us here. Uh, let's, let's talk about outbreaks. I'm sure you have plenty of cool stories uh, to tell. Maybe you could pick your favorite virus outbreak story. Jim, let's start with you. Good, well, you know, this, this outbreak, I was thinking, I've worked on a lot of outbreaks, but this one was really uh, exciting. And it occurred when I was assigned in Belém, Brazil. It was uh, 1978, so it's uh, 40 years ago. I was working at the uh, Institute of Andros Chagas with the, the small army unit there. And we got a, a message that there was an outbreak in a, uh, a small city called Belterra. And Belterra was actually a rubber plantation that was started by the, the Ford Motor Company in the 30s. And uh, they had rubber trees there. And the people that lived in this, this uh, city made their, their living hacking, <laughs> making sure that there was access to the rubber trees and, and harvesting, <coughs> excuse me, and tapping them. So, we get this, this message and people are, are, are suffering from a febrile disease that in, included severe arthritis and arthralgia, so much so in their small joints that they couldn't hold the machetes that they used to clear, clear the pass. Uh, this disease also had a rash that occurred just as the fever broke. Uh, it also was leading to death and it leaded, was leading to uh, psychosis as well. Uh, it, uh, patients had jaundice uh, and hemorrhagic manifestations, black vomit, things like this. So we really didn't know what this was, but it was pretty exciting. So we got there and over the course of, uh, I don't know, a month, couple of months, I, I don't remember now, we did a, a really comprehensive investigation and found out that two things were going on. One of them, uh, the patients were dying of yellow fever and this is, not surprising. This outbreak was in the middle of the Amazon forest. If you look at a map, there's a major river that comes into the Amazon from the south called the Tapajos, and it was in this area. So it's right in the middle of the jungles. And uh, so yellow fever wasn't uh, a complete surprise. But the majority of cases actually had what turned out to be Myaro, which is a, a, a different class of viruses. And at that time, there hadn't been many major outbreaks. There hadn't been any really significant outbreaks. There have been a few clusters of a dozen or so cases. Uh, so this uh, turned out to be really uh, exciting. And this arthritis was really dramatic. I, I remember a photograph that I took of a young girl who was like 16 years old, and, and she stuck her hands out like this, and the knuckle on one hand was two, two times at least larger. I mean, completely inflamed, and she really couldn't use her hand at all. And this persisted for some time. So we then looked into uh, what was the vector. Uh, we caught about uh, nine or 10,000 uh, critters, that, uh, ticks and, and mosquitoes and uh, noceums and all sorts of things that sand flies that exist there. And, and it turned out that of all of these tests, and, and we took them back to the lab and isolated virus, attempted virus isolations. And we were able to isolate both yellow fever and myaro from just one species of mosquito, which is uh, Hemagogus gentanomis, which is a traditional uh, enzootic uh, vector of, of yellow fever. 
Then we looked at uh, vertebrate hosts, and again, we caught, I don't know how many hundreds of uh, small animals, and it turned out that uh, uh, marmosets were very common there, um, and that these were actually being infected, and they were amplifying the, the virus, and we actually ended up isolating virus from, from marmosets. We did some experimental studies and infected them and demonstrated that the potential for, for transmission also. I mean, it was a really comprehensive study, number one. It demonstrated the, the uh, epidemic potential for Mayaro, and, and at that time, we said that, you know, this is very similar to chikungunya and some of the other uh, diseases that are transmitted by uh, uh, Aedes aegypti, and is Mayaro going to be the next one that emerges into urban transmission? Hasn't happened yet, but uh, uh, I, it wouldn't surprise me to see it come someday. So, so I'm sitting here thinking about the technology at the time. We're talking about 1978, so PCR isn't around. Okay, <laughs> so is this all um, virus culture and serology? All, all virus culture. Um, the, the Institute of Andra Chagas was established by the Rockefeller Foundation, and that was the network that fed into the Yale Arbovirus Research Unit. And they did a superb job of establishing best practices at that time, not only in technology, but also in record keeping. And one of the interesting things that we found during this outbreak is Amelia was there, the, uh, the, a good friend of uh, Bob's and I. Uh, she was running the laboratory, and we told her what was going on, and she said, you know, I think there was an outbreak in Belterra about 10 years ago. And let me look. And she had pre-bleeds on about half the people that we saw. Uh, she had created a serum bank and, and stored it there. So we could actually calculate from a couple of different mechanisms the incidence. So I, and it turned out about 20% of the population got infected during this outbreak. And there was very, very few, if any, asymptomatic infections. Everybody that got infected was uh, clinically ill. So anyway, so it was... In the long run, did this outbreak resolve itself? Or? It, uh, it burned itself out. Okay. So uh, had this virus been known before? The, the virus was known. There was okay. a couple of small outbreaks of a dozen or so cases. Uh, so you had Sierra. And, and isolate one-off isolates. But okay. So you had Sierra that you could use to type that, right? Trinidad, yeah. yeah. So, so there were Sierra available that you could use for neutralization. I guess that's how you identified it, right? Most of the serology was done by hemagglutination inhibition tests at that time. All right. Yeah. This and, was even before ELISA. So. <laughs> yes. And... There were standard cell cultures that you would use for virus isolation. Cell cultures and suckling mice. Suckling mice. Now, if this happened today, how would it? How would the response differ? Well, <laughs> you know, it, I, I'm sure specimens would be tested by PCR. I don't know if we'd get an, an isolate. I don't know if there's anybody that can differentiate all these. Uh, different species of, of potential vectors, speciate them and, and group them. Uh, same thing for the, the uh, vertebrates that we caught. I mean, we caught a ton of birds and mice and monkeys and other critters, you know. So, I mean, it really was a fully integrated field study. And getting that kind of capability or the resources to do that today is, is challenging. Bob is shaking his head. You can't do it, right? No, I think the NIH doesn't want to invest in those sorts of field studies. And as you, as Jim said, now somebody would probably sequence it, and you have the sequence, but you wouldn't have the virus. And so you can't, you know, you can't test its pathogenicity, you can't test its drug susceptibility. You wouldn't know anything about the you ecology, about the hosts, the whatever, really. yeah. transmission. Yeah. Yeah. We, we couldn't have done those uh, transmission studies with uh, the marmosets without the isolate. And, uh, so Bob, what's your favorite story? I think my favorite was um, Venezuelan hemorrhagic fever. When I was at Yale, um, there was an outbreak of hemorrhagic disease in central Venezuela, in the, in the plains or the Llanos of Venezuela, and a very astute Venezuelan epidemiologist, uh, the local doctors were calling it dengue hemorrhagic fever. And she thought it wasn't that, it was something else. In fact, she told me once she thought it was Lhasa because people were losing their hair who had had the disease. 
And she sent some samples, some tissue samples from some of the fatal cases to a virologist in Caracas at the Institute, National Institute of Hygiene. And she thought she isolated something in HeLa cells, which is not what you normally use for arboviruses. And she sent the samples to us at Yale. I was in at Yale. And Bob Chopin and I worked with him. I worked in a BSL2 lab and I inoculated animals and made immune serum and everything. And Bob did CF tests, and we identified it as an arenavirus and a new arenavirus. So we then got, I got an NIH grant, and we then started studies in Venezuela to see if we could identify or map the area where the virus occurred uh, to see if we could identify the rodent reservoir because we assumed it because it was a arenavirus. It was. Um, probably rodent form. And when we realized that it was an arenavirus, we couldn't work with it anymore at Yale because we didn't have BSL facilities. And C.J. Peters, who then was head of special pathogens, or I guess he was director? Chief. Yeah. Chief. And Tom invited us to come and work at, at CDC. So I went to CDC and later my postdoc went and several of the Venezuelan scientists came, and we all worked in a special pathogens lab at CDC. You would come on weekends and work with us, remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I had to mow my lawn one week. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how we worked it up, but it was very interesting. And, and only when you realized what it was, you said, we can't work with it here any longer, right? <laughs> no, but they helped us. <laughs> I would uh, find it a little unnerving to get what could be potentially a very pathogenic sample uh, in and start, you know, messing with it, trying to grow it in the lab. Was this uh, faculty member at University of Wisconsin named R.P. Hansen? Some people may recognize name. His, one of the things he was fond of saying is, microbiology is the last sporting proposition. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So today... Would it be any different if we had this outbreak? Well, again, somebody would have probably sequenced it from, from a serum sample from one of the fatal cases or tissue sample um, and could identify it as an arenavirus. But again, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't have the virus, probably. OK, Tom, how about you? Uh, probably my favorite uh, outbreak story would be Nipah in Malaysia in 1999. Uh, the story sort of starts in 98. Uh, if you're following ProMed, uh, there were reports of Japanese encephalitis in uh, the human population in a couple of focal areas. And uh, they started a program to do things like Japanese encephalitis vaccination, and uh, that didn't stop anything. So then it uh, became uh, clear that, uh, well, they, it wasn't very clear because they started calling it mutant Japanese encephalitis. Oh, great. Yeah. And uh, so eventually what happened was the outbreak spread into another area of Malaysia and a young uh, graduate student who was a physician who was a little bit older and had practiced made an isolate and uh, he took that isolate to Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, again, to identify it as mutant Japanese encephalitis, I think was the idea. But it ended up not being JE, and it wasn't any other arthropod-borne virus. So then he got on a plane with the materials and flew from Fort Collins to Atlanta. And uh, we were able to identify it as being related to Hendra, that uh, is a, another story associated with that. But we had made reagents, uh, sort of classical serologic and other uh, reagents that were as quickly able to identify it as a uh, Hendra-like agent. And then Bill Bellini in the Paramixos uh, section at CDC quickly sequenced it up and showed that it was related to Hendra, but it was a novel agent. And then the, the favorite parts was that I and a bunch of other guys went off to Malaysia, set up a laboratory, and uh, it was a zoonotic outbreak where pigs uh, were the direct source of the virus for humans that were being infected. So it involved uh, veterinary medicine as well as uh, the human medicine. It was a quite serious disease with people uh, essentially going into coma 
and uh, being put in intensive care units on ventilators with a mortality of around 40 percent. And the uh, eventual uh, doing away with the outbreak really resulted from us uh, setting up a scheme to identify infected uh, pig premises and then uh, uh, doing away with the pigs on the premises and also setting up a surveillance program to look for additional premises. So it was uh, a quite interesting and novel experience. So is NEPA still an issue in Malaysia? It was eradicated. I think I left uh, in early June and the last uh, human cases had occurred and that uh, premises was taken care of and there were no uh, additional cases in the surveillance system. I think they were with uh, the World Animal Health Organization able to sort of declare it free uh, shortly thereafter, midsummer, as I recall. Uh, and there have really been no additional cases. There were, uh, it's kind of a funny disease, there were some uh, relapsing cases of encephalitis associated with the disease that uh, something similar had happened in a couple instances in Australia with Hendra virus prior to that. But the NEPA uh, is found throughout Southeast Asia, the natural reservoir are uh, teropid bats, and uh, there's a, probably 25 species of those that uh, do occur all over Southeast Asia, extending to Africa and down the coast, and I think recently, uh, by largely by using sequencing, they've been able to identify related viruses in uh, megabats in Africa as well, but no human disease associated with that. So there must be potential for other outbreaks. But well, keep the there have been in India and Bangladesh small, okay. what I would call relatively small, outbreaks with exposure somehow to bats or indirect exposure to the bats that carry it. And in Malaysia, this is managed with surveillance. Still? Well, I mean, if you look at the Malaysia outbreak, what actually happened was it, uh, it got out of the reservoir host and became an infectious disease of pigs. And it was in the domestic pig population. And once that part was taken care of, essentially the source of the epidemic human disease was taken away. You, you mentioned that samples were brought to Fort Collins and then CDC. So were these virus isolates at that point? He had made isolates in Malaysia in a BSL-2 facility there, but they were unable to identify what it was. This was uh, very early PCR days, and Bellini, again, being uh, a person uh, associated with uh, paramyxoviruses, I think quickly came up with some primers designed to pick up near neighbors of Hendra virus. So that was sort of how the molecular part and the identification uh, sort of describing as a novel agent occurred. So do you think this is a virus uh, for which we need a vaccine? Well, there are people actually with a fairly large effort towards that. Uh, my own opinion is it's not the virus that's going to eat Chicago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, but, which virus is? Well, flu uh, would be one <laughs> uh, for sure. I mean, I, we all work with, uh, you know, agents that uh, go beyond that. I mean, if you historically look at the lab environment where flu has worked on up until the late 90s, uh, flu work was all done in BSL-2 facilities. And with the advent of avian flu, that sort of changed and uh, it's gotten worse or, or more complicated, maybe is a better way to put it since then. Mm -hmm. So uh, we haven't mentioned Ebola virus at all. Do any of you have an Ebola virus story? I have lots of Ebola virus <laughs> stories. But, um, I mean, uh, I was in the Army, uh, as well as Jim, at USAMRID when we had a visitor, uh, Ebola virus, in Reston, Virginia. And this uh, came out of the Philippines with imported macaques that uh, had a, a, a syndrome that uh, was a hemorrhagic disease of primates. And uh, you know, if you've watched uh, some of the movies and TV documentaries about this, uh, Peter Jarling was contacted by some of the veterinarians at Hazleton Laboratories. Uh, they've changed their name since then. And uh, they thought it was simian hemorrhagic fever, which is a, another type of virus that has caused similar outbreaks in monkey colonies, but uh, they isolated something and it didn't turn out to be semen hemorrhagic fever. It turned out to be an Ebola virus, which is 
uh, different in terms of its human pathogenicity. Uh, certainly during investigations of that outbreak, uh, we discovered uh, the, the source, uh, the, the one facility in the Philippines where it was continuing to be transmitted, and they've had had, had several uh, subsequent small outbreaks, and uh, it, it, that, that facility's now closed and gone. Uh, so what was the original source? Uh, monkeys from the Philippines? It, it was sourced at a place called Furlight Farms that was called Facility B, I think, in the papers that were written. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly where the virus came from is still not certain. It's thought, again, to be bats, but uh, it's not really been worked out. And uh, the same can be said for the African strains, that we believe that bats are the source. One of its cousins, Marburg virus, the group at CDC has pretty clearly demonstrated the reservoir to be a certain specific bat, Rosetta aegypticus, but, uh, but there's not solid evidence of Ebola coming from this bat or that bat. So what would you say would be solid evidence for that? Well, there, there have been uh, a number of PCR hits with the bats, but uh, if you look at the history of that, they're in the early 2000s, and in spite of efforts to continue some of that, there are really no hits subsequent to that. And there's a lot of anecdotal stuff, but the uh, sort of solid demonstration is just not there. Uh, reproducibility is really key Well, it'd be key to part this. of it. And, uh, you know, I mean, people looked at the same species that the hits were in in the early 2000s, and they've largely come up empty-handed. So it, it's, a, it's kind of what I would describe as the holy grail for guys like me. Uh, and it's still out there awaiting uh, some guy with a funny felt hat on to discover it. Yeah. But you don't think we need to have infectious virus from bats? you think PCR is enough? Well, I think uh, certainly PCR, but the ability to repeatedly okay. go back to the same place and demonstrate that the virus is circulating in the population is part of what we, I, I think, in the Marburg instance, hung our hats on. And I think getting isolates is also important. Uh, the, you know, one of the, the remarkable things for me is that the bats don't have that much virus compared to what you find in a human being or a monkey that's been infected. So sometimes maybe the, the PCRs have a great deal of sensitivity. Virus isolation is pretty sensitive for this as well. And uh, so the phylogeny of outbreaks is uh, very interesting in that outbreaks uh, always involve a novel strain. I mean, it's uh, one, one or one and a half or 2% different from the last outbreak in a different geographic area. So, you know, it sort of suggests it's out there in these reservoir species and uh, the transfer uh, from the reservoir species to humans occurs, you know, not that commonly, but it certainly happens again and again. Yeah. So is, are, are people trying to isolate from bats or is that? Yeah, after, uh, particularly after the uh, the West African outbreak, when there was a lot of money, I think there are a number of groups that have put quite a bit of effort into this, including the group at CDC, and, uh, you know, they, they still don't get an answer. They, they've discovered yet another Ebola virus in the, in the efforts, but they haven't. Yeah. So you, um, in that outbreak, the, the West African, there was, I think there was an index case, right? Yeah, identified? Well, yes and no. I mean, there, I would call it an anecdotal report of a young kid who visited a tree where there were bats. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. That, that's anecdotal, right? And, and in the current DRC, same situation. There's no... I, I don't know that there's a specific index case and link to, you know, a specific bat and that. There are a couple of other instances with the Sudan outbreaks. Uh, there were a couple of repeated outbreaks that happened in the same cotton factory in a town called Nazara in that instance. Uh, but there have been other Sudan outbreaks that don't have you know, the same history. Part of the cotton factory, there were bats hanging in the belfries or the 
uh, the, the the sort of yeah. part of the roof that people got exposed to. So do we do we not know in in these outbreaks whether the spillover into humans represents contact with a with a primary reservoir or some sort of intermediate uh, uh, well, host? Well, there's certainly instances where uh, non-human primates, gorillas in some instances, or chimps have been where the humans were clearly exposed, and those are not thought to be the primary reservoirs, again. So there, there is a vaccine that's been used in West Africa and currently in DRC. Do we have a sense of how it's performing? Because we can't tell. Well, I think the vaccine works fine, but that, that's not the solution to the issue, I would say. Uh, they're using it in a, in a couple of modes. One is uh, pre-exposure, for people that are high risk, like medical uh, care personnel. And then the other mode is uh, ring vaccination, which is sort of like smallpox eradication dependent on for control. And But in DRC, the outbreak continues, right, despite that? Yeah, so they haven't vaccinated the general population. And uh, part of the problem is how do you control an outbreak? And prior to vaccines, there is a, a means of doing it, which is uh, largely find cases, find all their contacts, and trace them. And if you uh, can isolate the contacts who may end up being infected, you can stop the transmission chain. That's traditionally how outbreaks have been stopped. But in West Africa, in this one, the, doing that has been difficult for different reasons. It just got too far in West Africa to manage. And in this one, the security situation has played a large role in them not being able to do an adequate job of those simple principles. You spent a lot of time in West Africa, right? I, I went early in the Sierra Leone uh, component of that outbreak. Well, what were you doing? Largely, I sat in the capital and tried to help direct efforts at control, and uh, not very successfully because it got a lot worse uh, as time went by. Now, eventually it did stop, right? What's, what, why is that? Well, I mean, I would say uh, it, it wasn't uh, because of control efforts on the part of uh, the partners, the uh, external uh, experts who came. Uh, there were efforts to educate people about what the risk factors are, certainly. But I think as in the initial 1976 outbreak, the population sort of figures it out. Uh, there are certain behaviors that put you at direct and very severe risk of infection. And once they get that, they, they manage to figure out how to control it themselves. And I think certainly in both uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone, those were the largest factors in the control. And that's not happening in DRC right now. It doesn't appear to be. <laughs> Right. Okay. One of the things that uh, always interests me is Ebola gets a tremendous amount of press, and yet there's other diseases, and I think in particular Lassa, that kills thousands of people every year in, the, in, in Africa, and it doesn't get the same kind of press. Well, why is this? Well, I, I think the fear factor in the, the, the press uh, books, movies have given Lassa, not Lassa, Ebola, a leg up. I mean, the other you know thing I would fully recognize, you go to an Ebola outbreak, and even though it's very bad and there's a lot of mortality from Ebola, there's more kids dying of malaria than are dying of Ebola. So, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a pretty severe in situation that uh, engenders a lot of fear, but they got other problems that, uh, that aren't being dealt with. And what is the situation with uh, Lhasa? Is there a, an, an intensive uh, effort to tamp that down in some fashion, control it? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd say that there's uh, more recently uh, Nigeria, uh, and the, they have a couple different strains in different endemic areas, has gotten a lot more attention, and there's beginning to be a lot more funding from uh, donor sources, NIH uh, funding would be great. So there's more effort, I would say, at developing vaccines uh, right now or, or other drugs that might be used as treatments. And so, you know, I think that science is 
uh, advancing uh, in attention and uh, loss is probably a lot simpler to deal with because it's an endemic situation and doing field trials should be a lot simpler than a disease that's sporadic and we don't like to have outbreaks that go on forever like the current one in DRC. Listen to TWIV 548 at Stefan Gunther who goes to Africa and is working, you know, you must know Stefan yeah. Gunther working on Lassa. So, so uh, Steve, do you, do you have another story you'd like to share with us, another outbreak story? Um, well, I, I did want to add just a comment on the importance of Ebola. And, and one of the, the things that's kind of unique about Ebola outbreaks in general is that it generally comes to international attention because uh, of outbreaks based in hospitals. So doctors and nurses are, are dying. And when you put that loss of human capital in the context of a, countries where there aren't all that many doctors to begin with, it has a tremendous sociological impact. I mean, it really is a devastating blow. And certainly the, the situation in West Africa demonstrates that quite, quite thoroughly. So. Okay. So do you want to share another story with us? Another story. <laughs> Another outbreak story? Well, sure. Um, when I was at CDC, uh, everybody, I, you know, I say everybody knows about SARS, but then everybody's not as old as I am, so maybe they don't. But, you know, after the SARS outbreak, which occurred in 2003, and I can tell you that, uh, as Tom can, that the activity level at CDC was just enormous at that time. And so everybody, when it was finally coming to an end, they took a sigh of relief. Well, so the summer of, of 2003, we as a nation had also been concerned about the risk of bioterrorism and, and uh, specifically smallpox. And so we were in the process of uh, trying to develop a new smallpox vaccine. And we had communicated with uh, what we thought were the clinicians across the country on what to look for for smallpox, how to diagnose it. So we thought that the country was all teed up or ready for, for any smallpox. Well, we get the, this phone call, and I don't remember exactly which medical center it was from, but they had seen a patient with a, a pox-like disease, and uh, they had, rather than calling CDC, they had isolated, and, and they isolated a virus, and they looked under the microscope, and they see this very pox-like virus, very on. And kind of the, mm, oh my goodness, and <laughs> quickly sent it to, to us. Well, this turned out to be monkeypox. And we started investigating this. And it, it was just a fascinating story in that the, the cases that came to our attention had been uh, kids and uh, a couple of family members, I think. I don't remember the details clearly, but they had been uh, in contact with prairie dogs, which were purchased at these uh, uh, kind of uh, flea markets in kind of this uh, silent uh, uh, industry. And we started following back where the prairie dogs come from. Well, they had been co-housed with somebody who had imported a bunch of animals from uh, West Africa. And we started looking at where they came from. Well, it turns out there's this incredible network of of uh, animals that are literally wild caught in West Africa. They got on a plane. I mean, this shipment had like 500 small animals, a bunch of dormice, but, you know, porcupines <laughs> and squirrels and, you know, all sorts of things, uh, including these huge uh, uh, chrysidomies. They're, they're big uh, cane rats, I think they call them. And, uh, and they're, they're a food source. And, and, you know, if you look on the Internet, people have got these for pets and all. Well, the bottom line is that there's this whole silent network that nobody is really monitoring. And, you know, from a public health perspective, here you, you got somebody who buys this animal. They're, you know, five-year-old daughters kissing a goodnight. <laughs> and uh, they're exposed to this disease that you know, we really had, had no experience with. So anyway, it was just kind of uh, an interesting epidemiological adventure. Hmm. Not much we can do about that trade, right? Well, I, I think there was some, uh, some regulations put in place that uh, trying to control it. But, you know, I mean, you start, the, Texas was involved, but specimens from here had gone on to, to Japan. And I mean, it was just interesting. <laughs> Bob, you got another story for us? Well, Jim talked about the Mayaro outbreak in Brazil. I, when I was in Hawaii, 
there was an outbreak of Ross River virus. That Ross River virus is a, another alpha virus, like chikungunya and myaro, uh, which is found primarily in, in Australia and New Guinea. But for some reason, um, the virus started to move across the South Pacific. And it went to the Cook Islands and to Samoa, and some other islands. So I was sent, it was actually someone from CDC, to investigate the outbreak in American Samoa. <clears throat> and it was a very high, the virus had never been there as far as we know from before. And so it was a new virus. And many people were infected. And I w it was very impressive, you know, these great big Samoan guys, and some of them look like sumo wrestlers. <laughs> they get pretty big. They could hardly walk. You know, they'd be coming to the clinic and they would just, I was very impressed with that. And uh, again, this outbreak eventually burned itself out. There's no vaccine. They did spray, but eventually it, it disappeared. Mm -hmm. But I was impressed. And I've never been in a chikungunya outbreak. <laughs> it sounds very much like the Ross River outbreak that I saw. So I'm, I'm curious to hear from all of you how um, virus discovery has changed over the years. I think we have heard a little sense of it, but let's just dig a little deeper. Tom, let's hear from you. Well, in terms of uh, the technology itself. So nowadays, next generation sequencing is available. So virtually anybody uh, that does next generation sequencing might be able to obtain specimens from an outbreak and uh, not only sort of identify it's a new agent, the sequences emerge from that. And, and that often happens, but uh, from my perspective, it's uh, kind of a double-edged sword. And that is that uh, the people that are sort of used to handling these materials don't end up getting the specimens any longer. And I find that disappointing because, as Bob said, there's a lot of other things you can do with the virus, which are, particularly if it's an outbreak of any size, are pretty important, like looking at antivirals if it's a new agent, uh, looking at the pathogenesis so you have an animal model if some further development and approval of a, a drug might be necessary. And uh, it, it makes it difficult to get your hands on the agent when... Uh, there are uh, folks that aren't part of the community that handle these sorts of agents that get involved. And it, it delays things, I would say. You know, that's from a somewhat selfish perspective, but uh, it has changed things. You know, one thing where I think next generation sequencing and these sorts of studies have helped us, um, we recently have gotten very interested in some of the insect specific viruses. And when you do sequencing on insects, or sometimes even isolates that you get from insects, and we use mosquito cells, one of the cell cultures we use is Aedes albopictus cell line, as well as Varroa. And you isolate some things easier, dengue for example, or yellow fever, it's easier to isolate it in mosquito cells than it is in vertebrate cells. But when you look at this, the sample, if you grind up a pool of mosquitoes, and what you have in the culture. Sometimes you have two or three other viruses, which are viruses that are in mosquitoes. And some of these viruses are, are very closely related to some of the pathogens. There are buniviruses, rhabdoviruses, and especially flaviviruses. And there's a whole group now of flaviviruses. Flaviviruses are things like dengue, yellow fever, West Nile, uh, that are very closely related. So, one of the things that people are studying now is what these are uh, naturally occurring viruses in mosquito populations. And so what do they do to the mosquito's vector competence? Do they inhibit West Nile or Zika? Or do they actually enhance it? We don't know. And so there's a lot of interest now in some of these mosquito-specific viruses. And we've, we've been isolating a lot of those. So Jim, thoughts? Yeah, well, um, I think one of the things that's changed uh, significantly and really impacts the entire field is the ability to uh, share isolates, especially internationally. And this, uh, you know, Bob Shope and Bob Tesh and the Yale Arbovirus Research Unit, they, they were built on a foundation of uh, sharing 
viruses and reagents and building capacity so that people could address their, their issues. And, and as the technology is, has changed and we're getting more molecular, we don't, we're not getting the isolates, we're not having access to the material so that we can really characterize it, so that we can do the pathogenesis studies in animals and, and some of the critical things that are necessary. And a lot of this goes back to influenza and the, the, the discussions of several years ago now on, on virus sovereignty. And well, you know, give me a break. <laughs> Just, uh, I, I think that uh, this is seriously impacting our ability to maximize the, the technology and, and, and uh, really go forward in the science. Is there uh, anything in particular that keeps you up at night, Tom? Well, again, I, you know, I, I mean, people mention influenza viruses, and I think that that's one of the big threats because this is sort of a natural system that we know uh, there'll be new epidemic. And uh, as we saw in 2009, although it wasn't as serious, there'll be new pandemic strains that will arise. And if they end up being like 2000, uh, not 2000, uh, 1918, uh, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that uh, I, I'm really concerned about. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there, there are people who talk about rapid development of therapeutics, and influenza has built into it sort of a mechanism for rapid uh, advancement of uh, the latest strains in the uh, annual vaccinations that people, particularly of my age, receive. Uh, but uh, it, it, it doesn't work so fast that it may really inhibit the pandemic. As we saw in 2009, how fast did it move? I mean, it really moved with tremendous rapidity around the entire globe. Yep, yep. Nothing like uh, no immunity to help that out. Bob, what keeps you up at night? You sleep well? I, well. <laughs> like you, I think... The, the thing that really worries you is influenza. Okay. You know, when you read the story of the 1918 outbreak and the number of people who died, young people, you know, millions of people died around the world. And, and the reports from the United States, um, you know, if another pandemic like that came again, and especially with our elderly population, now that everywhere, there'd be a lot of deaths. Can I add to that? My my last job at CDC was uh, to run the the ICU, the influenza coordinating unit, and our job was to uh, put together the national strategy. and, and This was kind of driven by H five N one at that time, which was in the headlines. And we had all these plans of global surveillance, and we're going to isolate the, the population and use oseltamivir to, to damp it down and all this. 2009 came, that virus was literally around the world before we recognized what was going on. I mean, it was just uh, astonishing to me how quickly, and you think about how much we move now, how, you know, the, the travel internationally, things get spread very, very quickly. So a virus that's efficiently transmitted person to person by the respiratory route is really going to get your attention. <laughs> We're old. Come on. <laughs> All right. Uh, these labs, these high containment labs are really expensive to build, really expensive to run. Amen. Are they worth it, Tom? <laughs> Well, I, I think, you know, we, uh, we played, a, I think, a particularly useful role during the 2014 outbreak in doing preliminary looks at uh, the specific virus strain and making sure that some of the vaccine uh, were effective against it, which I think people did want to know. So in, in a way, uh, they do pay for themselves. I mean, you know, I, I think it's unfortunate in the following way. I grew up in, uh, you know, the military and part of the defensive program that exists. Uh, but I, I, my own general feeling is that a real existential threat comes from emerging infections, from the unknown unknowns that are out there, rather than uh, some guy with a rag on his head in Afghanistan who's cooking up a batch of something that we already know about. And uh, so I think we have uh, the ability to 
deal with uh, the newly arrived uh, unknowns that occur, and I think these labs uh, do contribute. And having said that, uh, I you know I remember during SARS that one of the things you don't want to do is uh, just because it's novel and it's got a certain degree of ability to cause disease and even mortality, you don't want to lock it up in a BSL-4, uh, you know, in a strict way because it, that's going to diminish the amount of work you can do on it. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I got a foot in one part of this and a, another foot in another. Jim, is it worth it? Yeah, um, I think so. Our, our mission here is kind of threefold. Uh, the vision of, of NIH early on was to really harness the, the intellectual capabilities of academia, which is uh, uh, incredibly important. So we offer the the opportunity to not use surrogates, but to use the real pathogen and, and study exactly how that works. Our, our second mission is to make uh, uh, these resources available to educate the next generation. And I think that's incredibly important. Our, our graduates have, have gone on. They come out with very, very unique training and experiences, and they're, they're making an impact nationwide on policy development, on science. And, and the third aspect is product development. So we are able to take candidate vaccines, drugs, and, and other therapeutics and actually demonstrate whether or not they work to the standards that the FDA requires for, uh, for transition into human use. So all of the tools that are being used in the current DRC outbreak, the vaccines, the drugs, and the diagnostic tests, we've contributed in some small portion to the development of that. And I, I think this is a very, very unique resource and it's, uh, it's very expensive, I can tell you. <laughs> but it's also, I think, worth it. So speaking of the next generation, what advice would you give someone early in their career who wants to follow in your footsteps? Well, I beat a path here first. <laughs> no, I think you know, education changes, and a lot of it is driven on what your 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 mentor can get funded. So, but I think the the very unique resource that we have here is the uh, the human capital that exists, the experiences that we have, uh, we collectively, and well beyond just the three of us, and 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 also the ability to actually go in the laboratories and work with these pathogens. So, I. You know, I'm somewhat biased, but I think this is the best lab in the nation, in the world. <laughs> so, Bob, what, what would your advice be to young people wanting to do what you've done, be a virus hunter? Well, I had an opportunity uh, to work overseas. In fact, most of my professional career I've worked overseas, partly uh, when I was at a university here and at Yale before. And it's much harder now to get opportunities to work overseas. There are some grants and some fellowships, but not as many opportunities as there used to be. Um, your original question, I forgot. No, it's, it's, Advice to young people. Uh, oh, young people. Seeking to follow this path. <laughs> well, some of it is serendipity. You know, opportunities come <laughs> and you never expect it, and, and if you take advantage of them, you get, I mean, you get opportunities to travel, opportunities to Seize go new day. places or do new things. So you're saying up, uh, chance favors the prepared mind. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Say yes. Yes. <laughs> Tom? Well, I mean, you have to appreciate what a complicated environment working in one of these labs has become, not necessarily because of danger and safety, but rather because of security concerns. And that's the one thing I would try and, uh, you know, sort of tell young people is you kind of have to balance that with the excitement of what you could do in one of these labs. It, it's, not a, it's not a small step to, to take. I mean, somebody like me, who's been in the, immersed in this niche for a long time, I, I mean, it's hard for me to escape, quite honestly. But for young people, uh, I think there's a lot to be done, and it is uh, something that's exciting in a way, but there are complications that go along with moving into it. Uh, 
If I were a young, younger scientist, I'd probably pick up lepto or something that's not a select agent. Yeah. I think another thing, um, there need to be more opportunities for students and young investigators to work overseas. When I was younger, there were a lot more opportunities. There was the ICIDER programs that NIH had. Uh, there were a lot of opportunities to work overseas. I got to with the Peace Corps and you did with the, the military. Um, I think they should fund more of those sort of opportunities, fellowships for people to go and work overseas and have an opportunity. Yeah, I was struck by how much you three have done that. Yeah. Right? This is not typical nowadays, for sure. It's, it's much more difficult now, yeah. I think. Yeah. You've got to have a job to come back to. Right, right. It's, it's tough. All right, one last from, question from me. Jim, if you hadn't gone into science, what would you have done? <laughs> I, you know, I haven't a clue. I'd probably be homeless. <laughs> 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 you know, I, my, I came from a background where uh, you know, education wasn't high on anybody's list. You know, I'd be changing tires in the truck store, which I did, <laughs> and I didn't like it. So, okay, Bob, what would you do? Well, I started out to be a pediatrician, and I did a residency in pediatrics, and uh, I guess I'd be a pediatrician somewhere in a small town. Tom, yeah, the, somewhat similarly to Bob's answer. I mean, I got an education in veterinary medicine, and I be practicing or doing one of the more ancillary skills that wasn't so scientifically oriented, I guess. What does the Army need uh, uh, veterinarians for, Tom? Well, I, again, I started on the Air Force, so we had uh, a variety of programs. The majority of, I would say, veterinary medicine in both the Air Force and the Army really had to do with food sanitation. Uh, and that wasn't uh, what I was particularly interested in, but there were animals, uh, dogs that were used in uh, capacities of uh, tracking and uh, guarding facilities. That was another uh, source, and uh, you know, so that's the sort of uh, thing that brought uh, horses were the original reason when the Army was a quite different place. Right. Lab animals, too. I was hoping they'd get a different answer, but... <laughs> you, you want me to give that answer? You could, yeah. He, he told us this on the... So, so you know, in, in the military, uh, it was not uncommon to get that question. What, what do vets do in the military? And uh, one of the sort of trite answers was to take care of horses' asses like you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's a good way to end it. <laughs> that is SWIV special episode UTMB. You can find TWIV at microbe.tv slash TWIV, or you can listen on your phone or tablet. If you do, please subscribe. That helps us get more listener numbers, helps us raise money. Questions or comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, we do this on our own time and expense, please consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute, and we have ways where you could give a dollar or two a month uh, for the rest of your life, sure, <laughs> that's fine. And that would help us a lot. Our guest today here at UTMB, Jim LeDuc, thank you so much. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. Bob Tesh, thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, Tom Kaizek, thank you so much. My pleasure. Been a pleasure hearing your stories and reminiscences and sciences. Thank you, all three of you, for doing that. Rich Condit is a Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, and I just want to add my thanks. This has been a, really an amazing visit. I've really enjoyed touring the facility and, uh, and meeting everybody, and I really appreciate uh, your time and appreciate what you do. This, is, uh, this has been terrific. I also want to thank Dennis Benty for being very persistent and having us uh, come here. <laughs> Uh, it's been a really wonderful visit. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support. Ronald Jenkins for his music. Uh, now let's get rid of these shirts before I wrap up. Who's a TWIV fan here? Really? Condit has the best arm. Ah, there you go. All right, anybody else out there? Farther away. Whoa, that's really far. I'll try. 
Whoa. I didn't hit anyone. Throw it back. Oh, you can keep it. One more. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another twiv is viral. Thank you.